the biographies by autistic people lead us, Ian Hacking says, to understand more about the world of sensory experience. For instance, what it means to live with enormous sensory overload. They have too much sensitivity to what's around them. They're extremely sensitive to bright lights or to loud noises. It shatters them, and they can't put together, many of them, a different experience from, from different senses. The sound and light don't go together. They don't sort of see that it's a person who's making this noise. And so they teach us what's so difficult about the sheer world of sensory experience. They traditionally have a lot of social problems, and with the meeting in the past couple of days, people have tended to emphasize linguistic and social problems. I think one of the things we learn from the autobiographers and from some careful parents writing biographies of their children is at a lower level. It's at the physical and sensory limitations that where they're pressed. Something is wrong, with, or something is different from uh, most people in the way in which they receive information in the world itself. This, of course, makes communicating with people very, very difficult. Well, one of the worst environmental things, I don't have this problem. I want to emphasize sensory sensitivity is not just very variable, but the fluorescent light thing is one of the worst problems because you can see the 50-cycle flicker of the fluorescent lights, and it's like being in a disco. Noise sensitivity can be a real problem for some people. I wish they would do a lot more research on these sensory issues. It can be very debilitating. Temple Grandin. The meeting heard from a wide variety of researchers, but when it was all over, I asked Francesca Happe if the discussions had shown her any way forward. I think some themes have emerged across all the very, very different talks. One of them is the importance of sensory issues and that we need to take those seriously and do some solid research in those areas so that they can be incorporated into diagnostic systems or into schooling systems, into provision for workplace accommodations for individuals with autism. A second theme that's emerged is the importance of developing potential talents, partly as a, a direction for social integration, partly just for the richness of the inner life, and partly for future work opportunities. A number of the speakers have suggested that a lot of people with autism have the potential for talent and for enormous enjoyment of music, for example, or other areas. I think that's a, a key message for the future. If we could provide, for example, one-on-one -on -one music lessons for all or most children with autism, that might be in itself an enormous gift. How to start unlocking the potential of people with autism? At the University of Cambridge, Simon Baron Cohen's trying to find a way forward with autistic children by building on their own approach to life. We've thought about autism in terms of both strengths and difficulties. And one approach to intervention or education is to work with the strengths to try and boost the areas of difficulty. So if it's the case that people on the autistic spectrum love systems, but they have difficulty with understanding emotions, with empathy, one idea is to use systematic information like films of vehicles, um, trams and trains and cable cars that move in a very predictable fashion, particularly those kinds of vehicles that just move back and forth and just go in straight lines. So there's uh, you know, almost 100% predictability about their motion. And then introduce em emotions in this mechanical context. What we've done with very young children with autism is show them a DVD called The Transporters to children's animation, where we've got actors' faces grafted onto animations of vehicles, and just encourage the children to watch these animations. And what we found is that over a period of a one-month trial, where they were watching the film every day for 15 minutes, with their mother's or their parents' support, what we found is that recognizing emotions significantly improved just by being exposed to faces in what you might think of as an unthreatening format. Temple Grandin echoes the theme, build on people's strengths. She herself had a hard time at school. She was a bad student, teased for being different, and expelled when she reacted. But she had a supportive family and a science teacher who became a mentor and gave her a reason to study science.
She's seen that when people with autism and Asperger's are given the same chance that she was, their lives can be immeasurably enriched. Well, there's many people that are big captains of the tech industry that are Asperger, and they run really big companies. And I want to emphasize, we've got to develop the strengths. The skills are uneven. And, and a lot of these brilliant computer people, they, they tend to be more the pattern-thinking kind of mind. We've got to build up on that strength. Those people in Silicon Valley, they're apprenticed in. When those kids are 10 years old, the parents are apprenticing them into the computer industry. Now you get out into the Midwest, I'm seeing the same brilliant kind of kids that could have a great job at a computer company bagging groceries because you don't have anybody in the Midwest that understands the tech industry. You know, the thing is, if we didn't have Asperger's, you wouldn't have any radio station. Who do you think invented radio stations? I've done a lot of interviews, and I've been to lots of radio stations, and I've seen an engineer back in a control room, and he's as Asperger as they come. And where are all the old, mild autistics, all the old Aspies my age? They're all employed. I think the great thing for you, Derek, about your music making is it's brought you into contact with thousands of new people. Every time yes. we do a concert, we meet hundreds of new people and you always keen to get to know a bit about them. Yes. It's sent you all over the world, to Europe and America. To Europe and America. All over the UK, hasn't it? The Lots UK. Various forms of transport, which Derek isn't quite sure. Transport. And aeroplanes and things. Aeroplanes. And, of course, you've met lots of musicians and had just had a great time. And it is a very, very enriching experience. Apart from the music, it's all the social environment that comes with it. Conversely, you've added a lot to the musical environment, playing with Jules Holland, the great rhythm and, blues Jules, man. rhythm and blues man. Tonight, Jules loves to play with you because you've got such an original musical mind. I've got a, an original musical mind playing with Jules. Yeah, you like that, don't you? I like that, yes. <laughs> have a lovely evening, Derek. I will have a nice evening, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Wendy. If you're interested in the films of the transporters that Simon Baron Cohen's using to help young children empathise, you can find out more at www.thetransporters.com. Temple Grandin's latest book, Thinking in Pictures, is published by Vintage. Adam Ockelford's biography of Derek Paravicini is called In the Key of Genius, published by Arrow Books. Thanks to studio manager Adele Conlin. This is Wendy Barnaby in London for The Science Show. Thanks, Wendy, who lives in England but comes from Adelaide. And next week we shall go to Cambridge to look around the rooms of a fellow who was without doubt a genius but showed none of the savant characteristics of those we've just heard about. Charles Darwin seemed to be a mild young fellow with not much in the way of extreme cleverness to make him stand out at school or university. So what was it like when Darwin was up at Christ's College? And what did he have for breakfast? This much smaller area is where Darwin, this was his private space. So in this little back corridor, there would have been a bed where Darwin would have slept. And he had a dog. The dog may have slept on the bed with him. But back here, he would have been his dressing room. It was his private room. And the gyp would have come in in the morning at 6.30 to wake him up and would have brought some hot water for him to wash his face and perhaps to shave. And then at 7, he had to be dressed. He had to go across the court to chapel until 8. Then he would come back to his rooms and his gyp would serve him breakfast, which was bread and butter. That's all <laughs> there was. You could have tea or coffee, but you had to provide the tea or coffee. I, see. I must say that a gyp is the college servant. They're called scouts in Oxford, gyps in Cambridge. Mm. And so he would have had a permanent one to himself. Well, it wasn't just at Darwin's, no. It was the, it, all the rooms on this staircase yeah. shared the same gyp, so he would have gone from one to the other. John Van Wy is a fellow at Christ's College and in charge of the research about the young Darwin. That's next week. And don't forget the Darwin exhibition opening next week at the National Museum of Australia, straight from New York, from next Wednesday to March next year in Canberra. I'm Robin Williams. Hello, Michael McKenzie here, inviting you to join forces with Bush Telegraph on a new online project. Our much-loved country viewpoint has a new diving platform called The Pool, where you write about your life outside our cities and then post it for all to see. For more details, visit pool.org.au and keep listening to Bush Telegraph.